Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast. Our topic is the continuing adventures of CMOS technology, power and linearity at microwave frequencies, sponsored by Peregrine Semiconductor. I'm Nancy Friedrich, Content Director for Penton's Design Engineering and Sourcing Group. Let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the yellow Help icon below the slides. To maximize the slide presentation window, press the small green button at the top right corner of the slide window. We welcome your questions during today's event. Just type your question into the question window on the side of your screen, and then hit the Submit button. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. But please, feel free to send in your questions at any time. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Microwave and RF website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. You may also download a PDF copy of the slide by clicking the green folder icon in the toolbar beneath the slide. Let me now introduce today's speaker. Peter Bacon is Director of System Integration at Peregrine Semiconductor, where he oversees product requirement definition, technology feasibility studies, and application support. Peter has over 30 years of RF product development experience gained at Peregrine, Skyworks, Connexent, IBM, Raytheon, and Harris Microwave. He received his BSEE and MSEE degrees from Lehigh University and his MBA from Boston University. Now, let me turn things over to our presenter. Peter, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Nancy, for the introduction. Today we'll be focusing on the topic of millimeter and microwave frequencies and touching briefly on the market forces that are bringing these frequency ranges into the limelight. And then we'll look at a couple of specific RF functions to show how Peregrine's Ultra CMOS technology is well suited for these applications and is displacing gas and other compound solutions that have historically serviced these high frequency ranges. So the topics we'll be covering today include Microwave frequency introduction, just a look at technologies and applications, and then we'll take a look at CMOS technology and moving beyond Moore's law into what is more than more. We will then get into requirements that are needed to support high frequencies, then we'll look at technology fundamentals, linearity and power handling, and some models and design and simulation capability. And then we'll look at two very detailed examples of 45 gigahertz SPDT, and then an 8 to 12 gigahertz core chip. And then we'll look at high frequency capability in a more general sense, looking at integration and calibration and optimization and packaging, and then wrap up with a conclusion. So as we look at high frequency, the applications are on the rise, and they cover multiple markets. There's sort of two reasons for going to high frequency, general reasons. One is for increased resolution from radar and sensing, so medical and automotive security. And then there's the available bandwidth that really helps in communication applications, such as cellular and wireless backhaul. And if we look at uh, why this is happening, uh, it's really because the technology is becoming more available, more options to get us into high frequency applications. And then also, faster data rates are driving the need to get to the higher frequency ranges where the bandwidth is. And then the overcrowded spectrum that exists in the, much of the cellular and other networks is really looking for that same frequency band. So that's 
really the, the driver behind going to higher frequencies for a number of the communication requirements. And test and measurement needs to stay abreast of all these other applications. They need to provide the accuracy as well as the frequency coverage, and therefore that's also a market that is being pushed to really support greater instantaneous bandwidths at these higher frequencies. A couple of quick examples just to give you a sense that you know, this is happening across multiple markets. One is DirecTV, and they've been supplying satellites into the market to support their DBS offerings. And historically, they started out in the KU band, where all their satellites were doing KU band transponders in the, the 10 to 14 gigahertz range, whereas the latest satellites have been almost entirely KA band transponders going up on the satellites, covering from 17 up to 30 gigahertz. And so that continues. And the, the reason for that is the existing satellites supporting KU band are still there, and they need more bandwidth for greater content, so available at KA. Another one happens to be automotive radar, and this is really being driven by two things. One is the proliferation of radar within mid and high-end cars continues to increase. But then there's also a shift within the automotive radar market itself from 24 gigahertz to 77 gigahertz for the increased resolution that the higher frequency provides. So just two very quick examples. The one I'd like to spend a little bit more time on is looking at wireless communications. This seems to be moving up in decades where just a few years ago, we were looking primarily at 0.3 to 3 gigahertz, and now we're talking about 3 to 30 gigahertz, or even higher if we think about wide gig. And that's corresponding to wavelengths of 100 to 10 centimeters and then 10 to 1 centimeter. So that's really where the millimeter wave reference comes from. And if we look specifically at cellular, the next generation, the fifth generation, is looking at the next cost versus bandwidth optimum. The FCC has issued a notice of inquiry. The NOI number 14-154 was released last October. And there are more than nine different bands that are being considered for placement of the fifth generation. So it's a lot of questions being asked, not a lot of certainty, except that it's going to be a higher frequency and greater bandwidth. Another dimension that I'd like to look at is uh, from a CMOS perspective, we have the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors that has uh, been working primarily on the Moore's Law concept that the complexity or the number of transistors in a complex IC doubles every two years. And that's coming from Gordon Moore's analysis that he had done a number of years back. And the ITRS provides a 15-year assessment of the semiconductors industry's future technology requirements, and that helps guide uh, the present-day investment strategies. And so with that, um, the concept of Moore's Law, but then also device scaling that really supports Moore's Law really comes into play here. And the idea is for technology generations, uh, some uh, sequential generations, each one is scaling the device geometry such that we maintain a constant field within the channel. And so if we take a factor of S and say that's going to be our scaling factor, let's just say we're going to decrease everything by a factor of 2, then 1 over 2 becomes the dimensions for most of the physical geometries, half the size. The doping is doubled. The voltage is halved. Integration gets a factor of 4, 2 squared. And then delay is half, and power dissipation is also 1 over 4. But the E-field that's within the channel stays constant. So that's really the, the fundamental uh, measure by which we define the, the scale device. Now, the ITRS also has come up with a concept called more than more. And they've noticed that there are some value-added features that uh, these functionalities do not necessarily scale according to Moore's law. And they refer to this as being the more than more domain. And it encompasses a number of things that the fundamental digital technology really has only glanced off during its uh, progression down the scaling curve. And those are RF analog, passives, high voltage, 
sensor, sensors and actuators and biochips. So they put together a very nice graphic that helps sort of put this in perspective, that on the vertical, we have the very classic and very straightforward scaling of the CMOS device from uh, something larger to something less, going from 130 nanometer to 22 nanometer. And that's really driving, uh, being driven by the digital content increasing. But then on the horizontal, across the top, you have another section referred to as more than more. And this has uh, these other features that, to first order, may not scale directly with the, the fundamental digital scaling. So passives tend to be fairly independent of the scaling curve and often need to be compensated for getting down to much tighter dimensions. And then the analog RF, it's not so clear that dropping the voltage by a factor of two is helpful there, and certainly not on high voltage and high power. So today's talk, we're going to be focused on these three aspects and then how Ultra CMOS really helps address uh, these three topics in a CMOS environment. I would like to also take a small side trip. And since we are now a Murata company, how does that really help us in terms of this diagram? And from a very top level perspective, we bring from Peregrine the, the CMOS integration chip level capability and we now combine that in so we have a complete SOC and SIP capability that allows us to do more complete system level integration within a package. Now moving into some of the core things that Murata brings, just going to have two slides on this. They bring a very strong material development and process development to the table. And they also have been working quite a bit in high frequency design simulation and they bring a, a, a module capability to the, the table. And then a very strong manufacturing volume as well as manufacturing engineer, engineering capability to the table as well. So bringing into that is the IC capability that Peregrine has where it's very much substrate focused, process focused, and then the supporting modeling and simulation capability and focused on RF circuit design. And from Peregrine's perspective, these three all play together from RF design to RF CMOS and process to the substrate. All of these play together to really support the high frequency capability of the technology. So I'd like to get into that in a little bit more detail. We have two different offerings, and both of these have a common theme, and that is the, the substrate. The substrate is very much unique and needed for the high frequency applications. So the high resistivity, either a silicon-based or sapphire-based, is needed to minimize the losses at the high frequency. In addition, uh, we leverage in both of these capabilities the fundamental scaling of CMOS. So we have these two things going on, a very unique substrate, and then the scalability of the CMOS manufacturing. That has two aspects. One, we can follow the, the baseline scaling curve, so it's a generational thing in terms of the technology, but then the volume manufacturing of the CMOS space that's in the, the industry today, we can leverage that as well. Now, looking at microwaves and millimeter wave circuits, I've had some history with that. So there's a number of different substrates that have been what I call classics in the industry, alumina being probably the most known. Uh, beryllia, aluminum nitride, infused quartz, or a couple others. Um, laminates that I'm not going to touch on today, but they are beginning to show up more and more in the 20 to 40 gigahertz range. And then within the semiconductor realm, there's gas, GAN, glass, some silicon, and some sapphire over the, over the many uh, years that the uh, industry has been in, involved in microwave and millimeter. What options exist for CMOS, though? And they're, really are three different uh, sort of general substrates that are available. One is you could work with bulk, but we're not going to dive any deeper into that because the, the fundamental losses of the, the bulk substrate, basically a, a low resistivity silicon, is just not something that a, a microwave circuit can live with. Then there's also a high resistivity and trap-rich SOI, and then there's sapphire. And the reason this becomes, these two become 
sort of uh, credible is if you look down at the, the charts in the lower left and right, we have the second harmonic and third harmonic of a simple transmission line. This is taken from a reference, uh, CCAR and et al., about looking at the, the behavior of different substrate uh, types under large signal. And what you can see is that the high resistivity silicon has a fair amount of harmonic generation. And then the trap bridge is significantly less than that. But it's only the sapphire that really tracks the, the through line measurement. So it's virtually not generating any harmonic content. And so you're left with a very clean, um, sort of very much out of the way substrate behavior from the, the sapphire. And that's what you're looking for, something that is low loss as well as not contributing to any linearity effects. So looking a little bit more specifically at Sapphire, why is it uh, doing so well? And the main reason is alumina is very much the same material as Sapphire. Sapphire is the crystalline form of alumina, and also it's known as alpha alumina. So there's uh, the material makeup, aluminum oxide, it's the same for both, but Sapphire is the crystalline form, so a more pure uh, material than alumina. And then comparatively with other technologies, it does have a 10x better loss tangent than silicon and 3x better than gas. And its very high resistivity substrate minimizes the substrate and parasitic capacitances. I mentioned linearity, and those capacitances generally have some subtle nonlinearity component to them. A couple other benefits of sapphire is the CTE uh, mismatch between materials is uh, virtually not there when you match up uh, sapphire and alumina. So you can do flip chip dye down onto ceramics and alumina and get very good agreement in terms of the mechanical stresses. And then finally, because it is a very uh, inert substrate, there's no interaction caused by uh, radi radiation effects. And therefore, we're both latch up free as well as radiation tolerant with this technology. Now going into a few metrics, as we get into high frequency, the nuances of interconnects becomes a bit of a challenge because every bit of metal has a finite uh, transmission line effect due to it. And they begin to add up and become prominent or factors in the design. So we have a finite inductance and capacitance, a series inductance, shunt capacitance, and then a resistive and conductive losses associated with them. So there are a number of implementation subtleties. And what, I've shown, what I'm showing here is a microstrip architecture and then a strip line and a coplanar. Because of the sort of the embedded nature of strip line, it, that lends itself more to a laminate solution and not a semiconductor solution. So I'm going to focus on microstrip and coplanar. And what is shown in the table at the bottom is a comparison of the characteristic impedance uh, for the two different scenarios, the microstrip and coplanar. And what is done is the different physical parameters are varied by percent or micron. And you can get a sense of the sensitivity of the microstrip versus coplanar to those variations. So we have metal thickness. We have the interlevel dielectric that sits on top of the substrate. And this is used in separating the different metal levels at the top of the substrate. And then we have sapphire thicknesses. Uh, thickness is changing plus or minus 5%. And then line width is changing 2%, and spacing is 2%. So the coplanar waveguide architecture, uh, uh, sorry, coplanar with ground uh, transmission line architecture shows much less variation with the same physical parameters than the microstrip. And the only one that doesn't is on the, the metal spacing, where this is directly related to the capacitance is formed between the, the main transmission line and the ground that is right next to it. So that's understandable. But even with that sort of variation, we're still better than what the microstrip is doing. And we're insensitive to these other physical parameters. Now looking at the metallization stack that is available in several different technologies, this can also be a, a source of loss. And so understanding how they contribute 
again, looking at it from a piecewise uh, transmission line, each little increment has a resistance and understanding what that resistance is and minimizing that obviously helps improve the overall insertion loss. So these are four different coplanar wave uh, width ground structures and the spacing and widths are listed here. There's one that's done in a redistribution layer, so it's a thicker 5 micron layer. And you get a sense of uh, the main loss factor by just looking at the R column, the series resistance. And the last two become somewhat comparable in terms of the resistance level. Uh, but the first two, using the thinner, more embedded layers, uh, tend to have more loss because of the thinner metallization. So just something to keep in mind, and all of this needs to be factored into total design of a uh, high-frequency design. So what makes uh, Ultra CMOS ideal for high frequency? It's really three things. One is the substrate, much better than silicon, and even better than gas. It does have a very high resistivity, and that helps minimize the formation of parasitics and minimizes nonlinearity. And then we are CMOS in nature, so we are continuing to follow the CMOS scaling. And then finally, it's our internal design IP that we're able to implement full MIMIC architectures. And behind that is a, a robust modeling and layout and packaging capability. So I'd like to look at three different examples today, two of which we'll look in detail. And the, the first one that we'll look at is a pair of KU band mixers. I'm going to show these primarily for frequency coverage. So what we have is a up converter. This is a 10 to 14 giga, 4, 10 to 19 gigahertz mixer. It's configured as a double balanced for high RF to LO isolation. So you, we don't want the LO leaking into the RF path. Um, with a LO drive of 17 dBm, it achieves 21 dBm input IP3 and has a conversion loss of 10 dB. So this is targeting for the up converter on VSAT terminals, obviously test and measurement and point-to-point -point microwave links. And it is a fully integrated MIMIC solution, so it has the LO coupler and hybrid for the RF all on chip. Its sister part is the down converter, and this is focused a little bit more on IP3. You can see it's got an IP3 level of 24 dBm, conversion loss of 8 dB, covers the same 10 to 19 gigahertz range. And this would be likewise for point-to-point -point test and measurement and for the down conversion on VSAT terminals. Now the next series of charts, we're going to focus on a single pole double throw RF switch. And we're going to look at this both from a performance point of view, but also from a design trade-off, because I think it will be helpful to see how technology advancements in technologies can improve, as well as some of the design traits that need to be made for the higher frequencies. Uh, this part does have a very fast 24 nanosecond uh, transition time, and it achieves 2.5 dB insertion loss at 40 gigahertz, and maintains 50 dB isolation across uh, up to 50 gigahertz. And then its linearity and power, we'll look at that in detail. Here are the two primary metrics, insertion loss and isolation. You can see the 2.5 at 40, and then getting um, maintaining a good 50 dB isolation across its entire frequency range. So what are some of the design trades that are needed for supporting high frequency? Uh, I think the easiest way to do this is just use a very simplified RC-based model for the SPDT. So in the lower left, you can see that there's a, a simplified diagram of what is going to be shown in the numerical analysis. That for the through path, we have a R on, that its value is correlated to the C off 2 in the opposite series path, which is in an isolated state. And then we have the C off 1 that's also related to R on and R on 2 related to C off 2. So these are all related uh, numerically from a device periphery perspective. And so if we just simply walk through the analysis on the right, what you'll see is the, what I refer to as gate periphery, WG, is going to decrease. We're 
going to see what happens. Because this part, as it is right now, looks like it would do quite well at 5 gigahertz, where you've got very good insertion loss. And you've got about 34 dB of isolation. But if we decrease that, go down to 250, you can see that we really didn't impact the, I guess it's 10 gigahertz isolation. But we have picked up a little bit on the high end. If we go back one chart, we'll see the 13.2 versus 15. You can see that that's beginning to improve. And if we go one more click down to 200 micron, you can see we picked up another 3 dB. What's interesting is the insertion loss also improves, and that's simply because we're not losing so much signal to the poor isolation. And then finally, you get to the point where you're probably near optimum. And you can keep going, and you begin to see you begin to trade off your overall insertion loss for the isolation level improving. And at 100, this might be optimum, but if we go one more step, you're at uh, minus, almost minus 3 and minus 37. So you can buy quite a bit of isolation by sacrificing insertion loss. Now looking at the fundamental technology, this is looking at performance at 200 microns for a our U250 technology. And if we use that same model and just step down the curve here from 250, U250, which is a 179 product for our on C off to 113 for our next generation U130, Ultra CMOS 10, you can see that it buys about 3 tenths of a dB. It went from minus 1.3 to minus 1.0 at 50 gigahertz without impacting the isolation. And then Looking at this, you can see a uh, overall scaling curve um, for the, the technology that uh, we're going from U250 to U130. You can see the insertion loss improves. And then if we map that out one against the other, you can see the, the trade-off. So high isolation levels, low device periphery, we can pick up almost a, um, a dB of performance through the change in the technology. So there's certainly reasons to continue down the uh, scaling curve from just an insertion loss perspective. And then mapping this into sort of a real life trade-off, this is uh, comparing the 45 gigahertz performance measured from what it would be if we had then modified it for the um, trading off for better insertion loss, sacrificing the isolation. So we've gone from about 50 dB of isolation to now on the order of 30 to maybe 27 if you're going out to 55. But you can see that we've moved the 2.5 gigahertz, I mean the 2.5 dB insertion loss at 40. The corresponding point is now more towards 55 gigahertz. So we've made significant improvement there. Returning to power handling at microwave frequencies, this is the 45 gigahertz SPD team looking at its measured results. We have a 1 dB compression point, mapping that out from 18 through 40 gigahertz. And then correspondingly, IP3 measurements going very low in frequency up to 13.5 gigahertz. One of the challenges is actually finding equipment that will get you the level of linearity needed to measure this part at these frequencies, higher and higher in frequencies and into the 20 to 30 gigahertz range. But you can see the P1DB stays fairly consistent and begins to drop off as frequency increases. And much of that is, uh, part of that is due to the, just the thermal rise that's going to occur because we do have increasing insertion loss as we get out to 40 gigahertz. So you have more power being dissipated at the die level. Looking at how this device performs in comparison to other technologies and parts that are in the marketplace, this is a performance comparison at 20 gigahertz, looking at a pin mimic solution and then a gas SP, SPDT compared to the 45 gigahertz ultra CMOS part. And for insertion loss, we're pretty much in, in between the two at 1.5 dB versus the 1.2 and 
on isolation were consistently uh, a good 2.73 dB above, um, even almost 4 dB above the other offerings. And then P1dB is a good 3 dB above the pin mimic, and then the gas is uh, about 7 dB off. And then the significant difference is in the IP3, where we're well above 52 dBm at uh, 13 gigahertz, and then for the pin mimic, we're measured at the uh, 12 gigahertz, where it seemed to peak in the published data. It's about 44 dBm. Comparing switching speeds, gas devices are faster, um, pin mimic is slower, and we're pretty much in, the, in between the two. And then from a current draw perspective, the, the pin mimic has significantly more current than either solution at 20 milliamps. That's a plus or minus depending on how you have it controlled versus uh, less than the, on the order of a microamp for this particular part under ultra CMOS. So I wanted to take a closer look at the switching speed because that's something that um, I would say Peregrine hasn't focused on historically, but it is a design parameter, and this switch has gone to the point of demonstrating that, that if it is critical to the end use, we can get to very quick switching speeds. So this is a switching time looking at 50% control to 10% RF control. This is in the green. You can see that the main RF switching occurs in this section. And then looking at what it is for the actual rise time, as that's referred to, the RF rise time, it gets to be about 7.2 nanoseconds. I'm showing here the, the opposite, where we're going from the 50% control to 90% 90, 90 RF. And if we look at the sort of the corresponding total switching time, that's on the order of 24 nanoseconds. So very consistent between the two states, as well as the R off, I mean the RF rise time, fall time, on the order of 7 to 8 nanoseconds. All right, I'd like to change gears now and look at the second uh, detailed example. And this is a 8 to 12 gigahertz core chip. This functionality provides accurate amplitude and phase control for typically transmit-receive applications. So we have a RX path that goes through the, the phase and amplitude control, and then likewise a TX path that can be switched. So there's a switch functionality that's built in. There's uh, both phase and amplitude control, and it has broadband coverage. And key is to have decent isolation between the RX and TX and all the, the switched ports. This is uh, suitable for applications such as beam forming antennas um, to various radars and weather radar being a good example of that. And some of the key specs, it is um, six bit accuracy or resolution on both amplitude and phase. So we have coverage of 31.5 dB attenuation and that translates to half a dB resolution. And then 360 degrees and the six bit resolution is 5.6 degree. Uh, very good isolation of 60 dB. Conversion loss going through the switches and through the phase and uh, amplitude control is 14 dB. And linearity is uh, plus 40 dBm for an input IP3. One of the aspects of this part is because it is CMOS, we can add number of different bits and logic. They're easy to implement and don't take much area and don't cause problems from a programming perspective. So it gives great flexibility in terms of getting the best performance out of the, the part at a specific frequency. And what is shown here are three different charts on the right. We have what is referred to as default RMS. So we're looking at RMS phase error, and the default is if we were to use just straight 6-bit programming of this part, this is what it would look like. But if we were to use a lookup table, which simply means we have more bits to control this device than 6 bits, but if we map that 6-bit um, sort of fundamental architecture through a numerical array and program the part specifically for 
uh, center frequency, for example, we can improve its performance from an RF uh, RMS phase error perspective quite significantly. So we go from basically a four degree RMS phase error down into a one degree error for what we refer to as center frequency lookup. And what that means is we're using one lookup table, one lookup array for the entire frequency range that we're interested in. So on the right hand side we have sort of a narrow band view of it and then on the left hand side we have a, a much broader covering 4 to 16 gigahertz. So you can see that yeah, it's still very narrow in terms of its response. But we can take that narrow response and move it in frequency. And what we do with the blue line is that for each individual frequency point along here, we provide a distinct lookup table. And therefore, you can take the performance that you had at, uh, let's say, 10 gigahertz, and that can be the virtually the same performance from an RMS phase error perspective easily down into the 6 gigahertz and take you all the way up to 14 gigahertz. So this becomes uh, quite easy to do from a, a CMOS perspective. It's all, truly all about adding additional bits that from a interface perspective is very easy to implement and logic again becomes very straightforward. Looking at the counterpart to RMS phase error, we have the RMS amplitude error in a similar fashion and also using the same lookup tables. You can go from a default RMS that's on the order of about 0.6 dB in sort of a narrow band response as we look at the uh, full 4 to 16 gigahertz range. You can see that there's some points of optimum, um, but again on the order of 0.6 dB. If we then use a a center frequency lookup where we focus around 9.8 or 10 gigahertz, we can bring that down into the 0.2 dB range for a decent amount of frequency coverage. So you've got a, a good bandwidth here that you could work with. But then you can also make that lookup table very frequency specific so we can move that concept of center frequency across the entire range here and provide distinct lookup tables by frequency and get down into the 0.2 dB range 0.3 dB worst case over the 6 to 14 gigahertz range. So there's a lot of flexibility here that the fundamental CMOS environment brings. But then we're also operating up into the 12 to 14 gigahertz range. A related to phase, and I wanted to show this because of the broadband nature of it, but also the accuracy of it. Uh, related to phase is time delay, so they're related to one another through frequency. And so you can make a true time delay, and generally what you are trying to do is make that delay consistent across frequency. So similar in nature, but uh, the behavior of phase it would be proportional to frequency. What you are trying to do is make the time aspect constant versus frequency. What is shown here is a 4-bit true time delay. That is going from 8 picosecond to 64 picosecond binary weighted. And it's a 120 total uh, picosecond delay for the entire chain. And what is shown in the lower left is the 2 to 14 gigahertz behavior. You can see very, very much flat lines going across there. And so you can pick out sort of uh, subbands within this to take a look at how accurate it is in a little bit more of a uh, refined metric. And what is commonly used is a residual phase error where you're translating the time into a phase and you're trying to approximate, as the description here is, the RPE is a, a delta from the average straight line. So you know that with a time delay being fixed with frequency, the phase is going to move with frequency, and so you draw that straight line. And then you calculate the phase with regard to the specific time delay measurements and determine how far off that uh, ideal you are. And what is shown is that across that range, we have less than 0.25 picosecond difference. And that translates into uh, less than a minus 1 variance in the degree and goes up to a plus 1 on the, the top side. So roughly about a minus 0.5 degree to a plus 1 degree across the range. And then to give you a sense of the high frequency 
I think we're actually running into some test measurement issues in terms of getting out past the 26 gigahertz into the 31. You see a, a resonance that seems to be very consistent and then sort of a bimodal behavior right at 30 where things are going up. Sometimes they're flat, sometimes they're going up. And just subtle variations in visoir in the test environment can cause differences within the, the, the time delay behavior across states. All right, so coming into um, the topic of calibration and control, again, similar to what was shown with the core chip is because we are fundamentally a CMOS environment technology, the ability to implement complex control loops becomes quite feasible. We can implement any sort of control loop from linear to nonlinear, fully autonomous, or something that works with inputs that are proportional or integral or derivative of that input. So you can do a, a very complex. And parameters that could be monitored include everything from DC to microwave. Environmental parameters such as temperature, impedances, and then also even frequency aspects. What's next to us in terms of interferers? And are we close to something that's causing a, a reflection and so forth? So in the lower left is a generalized control loop architecture where you've got some form of controller. That's basically taking an input and creating a control signal to the element that you're controlling. And for simplicity, let's consider that to be a capacitor value within the circuit. So you have a signal going to that capacitor, and you're changing that value. And that capacitor, in turn, is used in a process. And let's say it's a phase shift circuit. So that capacitance affects the phase shift of that circuit, and you can modify that. And then you measure that phase shift and sense and provide a metric back to the controller by which it then goes about the loop. So we can do a completely autonomous loop on a, a variety of different measured parameters. So Ultra CMOS allows you to do that full integration. And if we use the example of the core chip, you can think of a receiver perhaps uh, listening uh, as a multi-element receiver listening for what's out there, detecting that there's a signal, let's say, at 8 gigahertz. And with that information, being able to modify the control to the phase amplitude to optimize its performance for the 8 gigahertz. So it would know what the uh, logic and lookup is for 8 gigahertz and be readily programmed for those values. So there's a number of different things that could be sensed. In this next slide attempts to walk you through some of the options that we've demonstrated in the past. For the RF path, uh, monitoring power and voltage, whether it's absolute or relative. And then also looking at impedances. So this could be two power, voltage, and current measurements to understand what's going on from an impedance perspective. And then frequency and phase detection. So use of counters and known references. And what's shown is a basic power detector and a very simple uh, phase detector uh, circuit. And then this detection could be real-time or periodic. And what is meant by real-time is we've demonstrated current monitoring and control for like amplifiers. So you're giving real-time control loop um, uh, functionality to your circuit, and you're, you're providing a very accurate current through the amplifier and adjusting that for other parameters, such as temper, temperature effects. So you're literally just looking at the current level and making adjustments on the, the control for that current. And some periodic measurements might be something like voltage monitoring or periodic temperature monitoring, just making sure that you're at the optimum point of operation based on what you presently have. There might be just slow variations in temperature or over uh, voltage supply, battery life, et cetera, that would uh, require some updating. And then finally, there might be some periodic calibration activity that really disrupts the normal operation. Um, all of these concepts can be uh, implemented within the, the CMOS environment. A final uh, topic for today is high frequency packaging. And there are multiple solutions possible. It amazes me the QFN style package continues to make progress in frequency. 
And so really what's aided that is the ability to model accurately the inductances and lead inductances, bond wire inductances, and all the parasitics associated with the lead. And being able to model that accurately within an EM simulation allows you to optimize it. So QFNs continue to make inroads at high frequencies, 40 gigahertz or even higher. Some of the mainstay and ones I prefer are more laminate or LTCC based. And the reason for that is you can customize the interface very specifically for what you're trying to do from an interface perspective. So whether it's wire bond or flip chip, you, you can customize based on what you're trying to do from an impedance and frequency range perspective. And both of these support multi-chip modules, so it gives you an environment for blending technologies if needed. And I had mentioned earlier that the LTCC offers an excellent uh, CTE match with uh, the Sapphire die. So a very clean, mechanical, almost stress-free uh, assembly on that. And from a, a flip chip point of view, we typically support either 200 or 150 micron pitch. And then finally, if need be, there are certainly ceramic cavity packaging options, so a little bit more high-end performance or reliability driven tend to be cost drivers and therefore um, I would say the general market is probably moving away from this architecture into things that can be either done dial level or QFN styled. All right, so coming to uh, conclusions, certainly uh, I think everyone knows that the demand for wireless data transmission continues to grow and that's really pushing to look for more bandwidth, and there's quite a bit of bandwidth. I don't say it's uh, available, but it's more readily found at higher frequencies, and more systems are moving in that direction. And Ultra CMOS technology is uniquely qualified for high frequency and focused on three specific things. One is the substrate is targeted for low loss and high linearity, and then fundamentally it's targeting the more than more capability which means we are focused on RF and microwave, high voltage and power, and high Q passives. And with the teaming of Peregrine and Murata, that just brings that to the forefront all, all the more and provides the, silicon on chip, the system on chip as well as the system in package capability. And then some real demonstrators of performance, looking at the 45 gigahertz SPDT, where it's got 2 watt P1DB at 20 gigahertz, typo there, and 52 dBm IP3 at 13.5 gigahertz. And then one degree RMS phase accuracy of the TR core chip, and that's enabled by purely the CMOS integration, ability to throw more bits at the, the problem and get to the accuracy that's needed. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was a great presentation. A few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. If you'd like to submit a question, simply type the question into the question window on the side of your screen, and then hit the Submit button. While we are answering your questions, we'd like to ask you to complete the feedback form which is located at the top of your console. You may also access the survey through the red globe icon on your widget bar. Our first question is, does Ultra CMOS provide any improvement in noise figure for low noise amplifiers at 6 gigahertz compared to a high-end RF CMOS process? That's a very good question. And I want to say that data that we've seen here is encouraging. And we are continuing to pursue or go down the LNA development path. I think it's a little too early for me to quote numbers, but what we have seen is promising. Excellent. The next question is, can CMOS ever compete with LDMOS gas or GAN in RFPA design? Let's uh, sort of parse that one out. 
Um, gas, again, depends on the power level. Um, if we are talking in the 1 to 2 watt power level, I think we what we've demonstrated so far in low frequency power amplifiers is quite promising. As we go higher in frequency and higher power levels, I really think GAN is going to be a stronger partner in that range. The challenge becomes uh, we're fundamentally a CMOS technology from a GM perspective and trying to compete with something where that is uh, much stronger, very hard to, to do that. But in terms of lower power where it falls more into a reasonable voltage handling requirement, I think we'll compete very well. Thanks, Peter. Now please tell us, how is this technology different from silicon germanium? Um, focusing on two things. One is the, the substrate is, again, still much better than what you might get from uh, just a standard CMOS bolt-on to a silicon germanium process. And then the other, which is more of a negative for the ultra CMOS, is you, you don't have the same gain level that you would have with a silicon germanium bipolar device, HPT device. And therefore, you have that trade-off. And so there are going to be some places where silicon germanium works well. There are going to be other places where ultra CMOS works well. Another differentiator is on the linearity. And some architectures work quite well with the linearity capability of the ultra CMOS, and they don't do as well in the silicon germanium environment. Great. Peter, can you provide some color on Peregrine's status with CMOS-based power amplifiers? Um, development continues, and performance is looking, I would say, competitive. And I, from my perspective, we're looking for the right slot to enter that in a, I would say, a combined Mirada Peregrine solution. Thank you. What are your practical frequency limitations? Um, it really becomes an issue on the switch side, dealing with device parasitics and metal resistive losses. So the challenge is to keep those to a minimum. And so it becomes sort of a back end of line optimization as opposed to a fundamental FET device limitation. Um, on the amplifier side, it is uh, more on the FMAX capability of the technology and from a, a layout perspective, minimizing RG. So I mentioned earlier that fundamentally we are sort of a GM light technology, but we do have capability that's showing FMAX getting up to the 180 to 200 uh, gigahertz range. So it is something that we can continue to push in frequency as well as performance. Okay, thanks for your insight. How high in voltage does the device stacking work to, and what powers can you handle? What levels of power, I should say. Right, okay. Um, from a voltage perspective, and I'll speak specifically for Sapphire, that you are truly on an inert substrate, and therefore you, you don't have any effect coming from the substrate. So we've demonstrated voltage capability into the 100 volt range on a number, I would say, a number of different applications. The challenge becomes in defining how much current needs to go along with that voltage handling. So if there's some, I guess, integrated aspect that we do can do quite well at and then have let's say, the current handling through a external technology. That's sort of an ideal situation for us. We can, uh, the challenge becomes we need to use device stacking to support voltage. And that hurts the through path resistive loss. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Peter. All right. Folks, it's time for us to wrap up today's presentation. Um, if anyone still is going to submit a question, rest assured that Peregrine will receive those questions and I'm sure get back to you. On behalf of Microwaves and RF, I'd like to thank you for joining today's webcast. Thank you to Peter and Peregrine Semiconductor for sponsoring this event for us today. Have a productive remainder of the day. <laughs>